Here we are at the very end, the final episode of our Beyond Good and Evil read-through. So we're covering the second half of chapter 9, What is Noble, and we're going to start with 268, where Nietzsche gives us an outline of his idea of, we might say, cognition. And this is a very important idea of Nietzsche's, but because it doesn't have like a neat little label, or if, I don't, can't, don't know if I can think of a one-word label for this idea, um, it's one of the less, it's one of the ideas of his that gets less attention yeah, in terms of the most influential or popular ideas that come out of Nietzsche. And uh, another place where this idea is outlined is in the aphorism, The Genius of the Species, which is found in the book, The Gay Science, which we did a whole episode on that um, aphorism in season two. But without further ado, uh, let's get into this passage. Quote, what in the end is common? Words are acoustical signs for concepts. Concepts, however, are more or less definite image signs for often recurring and associated sensations, for groups of sensations. To understand one another, it is not enough that one use the same words. One also has to use the same words for the same species of inner experiences. In the end, one has to have one's experience in common. End quote. And so, the nature of cognition is such that the concepts which will have the most capital, we might say, which will get you the farthest in the act or the task of communicating, will be those concepts which most easily or um, immediately relate to the experiences of the most people, to the most common set of experiences. And this conception of cognition that Nietzsche has is largely responsible for why he says so many of the things that he does about our best virtues, what is best about us, what is most exceptional about us, being totally uncommunicable, because for something to be communicable, there has to be a common experience of it. And so in some sense, the inner content, the deepest inner content of any individual is not something that can be put into words, because words necessarily are not individual, they are necessarily communal. And again, I think this is greatly fleshed out by looking at the genius of the species um, aphorism where just briefly uh, to go into it, Nietzsche says that if man had been a beast of prey, a solitary in nature, like we might imagine a predatory cat, uh, he would have never needed to develop the level of consciousness or sentience that we have. That consciousness is a mere net of communication between individuals and that Therefore, it's not enough to say simply like, oh, well, language shapes thought. You would say that language is the entire point of thought. That is where um, conceptual thought and the ability to put things and people and events into these conceptual categories is entirely for the purpose of coordinating action within a collective. And that, therefore, it is always what our conceptual world tends toward is always what is most common. Uh, in the minds and experiences and feelings of all the other individuals around us. And so in a way, that makes the entire intellectual world always tend toward what is common. And therefore, when we consider the eternal platonic tendencies in our thought and the perennial moral habits of thought that are imposed upon the individual by the collective... This is Nietzsche's ultimate explanation for that. That's why he begins, what in the end is common? What am I talking about here when I'm talking about what is common? And this is why I think the political readings of this last chapter, again, I'm not saying they're not valid or that these this kind of attitude of aristocratism or whatever we want to call it, I'm not saying it's not there, but that what is common or what is plebeian or what is aristocratic does have a meaning which is more significant than these contingent social relationships that existed at certain places and times throughout history. That what is common is the capitulation to the conceptual world, which is necessarily or inherently a product of the collective and its uh, use, its instrumental use of consciousness 
for this end of coordinating all the individuals and using them as instruments of the whole. And so uh, let's continue with the passage. Quote, Therefore, the human beings of one people understand one another better than those belonging to different peoples, even if they employ the same language, or rather when human beings have long lived together under similar conditions of climate, soil, danger, needs, and work. What results from this is people who understand one another, a people. In all souls, an equal number of often recurring experiences has come to be predominant over experiences that come more rarely. On the basis of the former, one understands the other, quickly and ever more quickly. The history of language is the history of a process of abbreviation. And on the basis of such quick understanding, one associates ever more closely. End quote. And so this is something of a reiteration of uh, some of the points that Nietzsche has made earlier in the text and then the chapter on peoples and fatherlands of what creates a people, what how this collective net of consciousness is created, why there are so many different collective nets of consciousness. Well, because they're based on a different set of commonly recurring experiences, which bring with them their own danger, their own needs, their own form of what it means to work or to labor, or what it is that we're working and laboring towards, and thus different ideas of the sacred and different ideals and values. And so uh, another place where we could look uh, for further elaboration on this point is actually Nietzsche's unfinished essay on truth and lies in the non-moral sense, where he describes how um, word concepts, designations, the common designation for a given thing or type of thing or event or whatever, um, originally comes from an experience or an emotional state, but that he describes it like a coin that's become debased or lost its embossment that's been rubbed off, right? The emotional uh, re reality or the experiential reality has been discharged through long common use. And it's simply at that point an abbreviation or indication for something else, a signifier of something else. And because that experience is a fleeting experience necessarily, the experience doesn't get reproduced with every time you use the word, the, the concept signifier. That's why the emotional content is sort of like leached out of it, that all that remains is a category and a social agreement to use the signifier to refer to the thing that everyone else uses the signifier to refer to. And a lot of this anticipates the work of Wittgenstein and um, I won't go into that any further, but uh, Philosophical Investigations would be the main work you could um, check out on that topic, and many people would say that Nietzsche anticipates Wittgenstein on this point. So let's continue with the passage. Quote, The greater the danger is, the greater is the need to reach agreement quickly and easily about what must be done. Not misunderstanding one another in times of danger is what human beings simply cannot do without in their relations. In every friendship or love affair, one still makes this test. Nothing of that sort can endure once one discovers that one's partner associates different feelings, intentions, nuances, desires, and fears with the same word. Fear of the eternal misunderstanding. That is the benevolent genius which so often keeps persons of different sex from rash attachments to which their senses and hearts prompt them. This and not some Chopin Howerian genius of the species. End quote. So um, before I cover that last line, which may have some of you scratching your head, and uh, rightly so, I just want to point out, he starts out by saying, the greater the danger is, the greater the need to reach agreement quickly and easily about what must be done. And what is Nietzsche talking about here in the broader context? He's talking about language. Language is essentially a process of abbreviation, and this process of abbreviation comes out of need to quickly and easily reach agreement about must, what must be done by using the regular commonly agreed upon signifiers to indicate the same things, we are able to facilitate this agreement. And so language is premised not upon the need to objectively understand uh, the truth of you know, uh, material reality or something of that nature, the way we might think of the task of, say, science. Language is premised upon survival, or to put it more perhaps more accurately to what Nietzsche's point would be, language is premised on wills of power. That language gives advantage to a given group to be able to easily coordinate their activities in order to foster the power of the whole. 
And so there are huge implications to this that are largely teased out in the essay on truth and lies in the non-moral sense about what the difference would be versus, you know, if we can consider language as a phenomenon, as a means of facilitating consciousness in order to understand objective truths versus language as a phenomenon, basically as a tool for winning, right? Winning the, uh, the battle for territory and resources against other groups, or even within social situations, being able to um, more successfully argue one's point or persuade or um, employ rhetoric to one's ends. And uh, as far as I understand, many anthropologists at this point are more or less on the same page here that let's say that uh, we, we're trying to solve some sort of problem that our group is facing and we get into an argument about what should be what should be done about it. Even then, the individuals engaged in the argument aren't necessarily trying to find the objective truth of the matter. They're trying to uh, win the argument. I want to be the one who has the best idea in order to solve this problem. And there's evolutionary reasons for all of this. Maybe more uh, important, though, N Nietzsche's remarks at the end that fear of the eternal misunderstanding is the benevolent genius which so often keeps persons of different sects from rash attachments to which their senses and hearts prompt them. So uh, what keeps the individual uh, from being swept away by romantic attachment, what allows them to resist the, um, the counter impulse, which is allowing them to resist the romantic or sexual impulse, is that fear of the eternal misunderstanding. The, the difference, the gap, the gulf between the understanding of our experiences and our feelings between men and women. And I think there might be something to what Nietzsche is saying here that's maybe more poetic than philosophical, right? That the, the ways in which we experience or associate different things with different feelings, intentions, nuances, desires, and fears, things he lists off, um, and the differences between the sort of masculine and feminine experience of the world, um, that could be one thing that uh, allows, could make the heart hesitate, right, before plunging oneself wholeheartedly into some sort of, uh, you know, Romeo and Juliet-esque romance or something of that, that nature. Although, so when he references the Schopenhauerian genius of the species at the end, um, to summarize this as briefly as I possibly can, Schopenhauer speaks of the genius of the species as being this sort of, you can think of a genius as like a spirit that sort of exists within the consciousness or being of all human beings, every one of the same species, um, by which nature attains her ends. Um, and that this genius of the species that seduces us to life to continually reproduce ourselves in this continuing samsaric reality, this is eternally at war with whatever might give the individual their own personal advantage. Schopenhauer says something to the effect that, um, you know, like nature gives us these illusions by which we will pursue things that are actually disadvantageous to ourselves because this genius of the species that is within us is simply using us for that purpose. And a lot of this ties into the ways that Schopenhauer thinks women are sort of these, these devils that seduce us to life, right? And so you might be wondering, like, why would Nietzsche say this here? Because it seems, well, frankly, very similar to the way Nietzsche would describe nature or life, that it always fosters these illusions upon its individual members in order to perpetuate itself. And furthermore, as we pointed out, Nietzsche ha himself has a passage called The Genius of the Species back in the Gay Science, and he is long past his Schopenhauerian period at that point. He can't uh, fall back on that like he does in Birth of Tragedy or in his second preface to Birth of Tragedy, right, where he says, well, I was under sort of these Schopenhauerian illusions at that point. He doesn't really have that argument at the point of the gay science. He's still writing about the, the genius of the species. And I have to say that it's, it's rightly a head-scratcher because um, Nietzsche seems to be suggesting that the genius of the species, as Schopenhauer understands it, is actually the opposite of what Schopenhauer actually writes. The only thing I can really think is that the genius of the species in the Schopenhauerian sense is a somewhat metaphysical idea. And for Nietzsche, maybe he's just simply 
especially because he's reiterating many of the points that he makes in that very um, uh, passage in The Gay Science, entitled The Genius of the Species, that we could say that what Nietzsche is doing is taking it from the realm of spirit and explaining how this conceptual world, which sort of binds everyone together into this one common purpose for the, the greater purpose of the common good, is something which arises evolutionarily. It's not uh, metaphysical and platonic, a sort of a spirit that just lives in the individuals. And that's what we're going to use to explain this. I mean, that's sort of like, you know, Kant fi- saying, by virtue of a faculty, we are able to perceive a priori uh, synthetic truths, right? It's, um, it's a non-explanation, whereas Nietzsche's explanation here is actually to look at the origins of language, the origins of conceptual thought and cognition, and say that according to the evolutionary foundations of where these things come from, uh, this is, well, you know, in the specific case he's talking about, this is where the fear of the eternal misunderstanding between men and women comes from. But the whole reason why you would have that fear of misunderstanding is because the entire premise of consciousness is that shared mutual understanding. And between men and women and the differences between the masculine and feminine, we perceive that gulf between uh, what my experience signifies to me or what this feeling or intention or desire or fear means to me versus what it means to you. And there's actually becomes a difference there that could make people uncomfortable, perhaps. And it's my best attempt at explaining this because I think Nietzsche um, is a bit oblique here. But we'll finish out the passage. Quote, which group of sensations is aroused, expresses itself, and issues commands in a soul most quickly is decisive for the whole order of rank of its values and ultimately determines its table of goods. The values of a human being betray something of the structure of his soul and where it finds its conditions of life, its true need. Assuming next that need has ever brought close to one another, only such human beings as could suggest with similar signs, similar requirements and experiences, it would follow on the whole that easy communicability of need, which in the last analysis means the experience of merely average and common experiences, must have been the most powerful of all powers at whose disposal man has been so far. The human beings who are most familiar, more ordinary, have had and always have an advantage. Those more select, subtle, strange, and difficult to understand easily remain alone, succumb to accidents, being isolated, and rarely propagate. One must invoke tremendous counterforces in order to cross this natural, all too natural, progressus and simile, the continual development of man toward the similar, ordinary, average, herd-like, common. End quote. And so not only is the common experience the most powerful in terms of communicability, uh, but the most common will be the most powerful. And so everything is always aiming toward the common. All morality, consequently, is always aiming toward become mediocre, as Nietzsche was talking about in the, uh, I believe, the last reading we did. And there is this just constant push to make everything more similar. And it's like the eternal tension I mean, again, to take it, a, we, we could say Schopenhauer says the same thing between the, the, the advantage of the individual versus the advantage of the species or the genius of the species. But it's the eternal tension between the norm and the exception, between the genome as it is, trying to preserve itself and stop any um, mutation versus, the well, the mutation, right? Um, and that this is the endless dance of life. And... This is why all the extraordinary people um, find that they uh, remain alone, succumb to accidents, are isolated, and rarely propagate. And who is Nietzsche? Sound like he's describing there. Sounds very much like himself. 269, quote, The more a psychologist, a born and inevitable psychologist, an unriddler of souls, applies himself to the more exquisite cases in human beings, the greater becomes the danger that he might suffocate from pity. He needs hardness and cheerfulness more than anyone else. For the corruption, the ruination of the higher men, of the souls of a stranger type, is the rule. It is terrible to have such a rule always before one's eyes. The manifold torture of the psychologist who has discovered this ruination, who discovers this whole inner hopelessness of the higher man, this eternal too late in every sense, first in one case, and then almost always through the whole of history, may perhaps lead him one day to turn against his own lot, embittered, and to make an attempt at self-destruction. 
may lead to his own corruption, end quote. So we've talked about this before, that um, Nietzsche has brought this up previous times in the passage, that the um, probability that a sort of exceptional person will turn out well is very close to zero because they will have this pressure. It's like being at the bottom of the ocean floor, right? The pressure of all those other water molecules, all those other uh, individuals of the herd telling you to become mediocre. Um, And then the solitude and the danger of living apart from that, of actually daring to say, no, I'm not going to be like the rest of you. Um, Well, then there's no one to catch you when you fall, right? And there's so many opportunities for you to become uh, botched or become ruined in some way. And this is Zarathustra's final pity that he has to overcome the end of Thus Book Zarathustra. So once again, Nietzsche says, you know, a born psychologist. So he's talking about, again, himself, or we could say the philosophers of of the future, the free spirits, because psychology is the route to these deepest questions. Whoever is looking at the human being psychologically and understands the psychology as a physiological thing, not, not that the psyche comes from the soul or something like that, but that it is a physical thing, an embodied thing, and then looks at man psychologically from that angle, um, they will experience this pity for the exception. But remember, in Zarathustra, he realizes to be consistent, right? He has to overcome even this, that uh, he doesn't need to pity the the higher man, the exception, and in some sense, he's not doing any favors to that kind of person by pitying them. So we'll continue, quote, In almost every psychologist, one will perceive a telltale preference for and delight in association with everyday well-ordered people. This reveals that he always requires a cure, that he needs a kind of escape and forgetting, away from all that which his insights, his incisions, his craft have burdened his conscience. He is characterized by fear of his memory. He is easily silenced by the judgments of others. He listens with an immobile face as they venerate, admire, love, and transfigure where he has seen, or he even conceals his silence by expressly agreeing with some foreground opinion. Perhaps the paradox of his situation is so gruesome that precisely where he has learned the greatest pity coupled with the greatest contempt, the crowd, the educated, the enthusiasts learn the greatest veneration, the veneration for great men and prodigies for whose sake one blesses and honors the fatherland, the earth, the dignity, dignity of humanity and oneself, and to whom one refers the young, toward whom one educates them. And who knows whether what happened in all great cases so far was not always the same, that the crowd adored a god, and that the god was merely a poor sacrificial animal. Success has always been the greatest liar, and the work itself is a success. The great statesman, the conqueror, the discoverer, is disguised by his creations, often beyond recognition. The work, whether of the artist of the philosopher, invents the man who has created it, who is supposed to have created it. Great men, as they are venerated, are subsequent pieces of wretched minor fiction, and the world of historical values counterfeit rules. Those great poets, for example, men like Byron, Musset, Poe, Lepardi, Kleist, Gogol, I do not dare mention greater names, but I mean them, are and perhaps must be men of fleeting moments, enthusiastic, sensual, childish, frivolous, and sudden in mistrust and trust, with souls in which they usually try to conceal some fracture, often taking revenge with their works for some inner contamination, often seeking with their high flights to escape into forgetfulness from an all-too-faithful memory, often lost in the mud and almost in love with it, until they become like will-o'-the-wisps around swamps and pose as stars." The people may call them idealists, often fighting against a long nausea with a recurring specter of unbelief that chills and forces them to languish for gloria and to gobble their belief in themselves from the hands of intoxicated flatterers. What torture are these great artists and all the so-called higher men for anyone who has once guessed their true nature? It is easy to understand that these men should so readily receive from woman clairvoyant in the world of suffering and, unfortunately, also desirous far beyond her strength to help and save, those eruptions of boundless and most devoted pity, which the multitude, above all, the venerating multitude, does not understand, and on which it lavishes inquisitive and self-satisfied interpretations. This pity deceives itself, excuse me, regularly about its powers. Woman would like to believe that love can achieve anything, 
That is her characteristic faith. Alas, whoever knows the heart will guess how poor, stupid, helpless, arrogant, blundering, more apt to destroy than to save, is even the best and profoundest love. It is possible that underneath the holy fable and disguise of Jesus' life, there lies concealed one of the most painful cases of the martyrdom and the knowledge about love. The martyrdom of the most innocent and desirous heart, never sated by any human love, demanding love, to be loved in nothing else, with, hard, with hardness, with insanity, with terrible eruptions against those who denied him love. The story of a poor fellow, unsated and insatiable in love, who had to invent hell in order to send to it those who did not want to love him, and who finally, having gained knowledge about human, human love, had to invent a God who is all love, all ability to love, who has mercy on human love because it, because it is so utterly wretched and unknowing. Anyone who feels that way, who knows this about love, seeks death. But why pursue such painful matters, assuming one does not have to? End quote. So I read for a long time there, but I think we go on a whole journey there with Nietzsche. And that last line, especially, why pursue such painful matters, assuming one does not have to, uh, I think brings us back to where we started with this last chunk um, of every psychologist um, you know, one can perceive in them a telltale preference for and delight in association with everyday, well-ordered people. This reveals that he always requires a cure. He needs a kind of escape. And why is that? So the born psychologist that Nietzsche is talking about, studying, preferring to study the rule instead of the exception, it's because studying the exception is so painful. And of course, that is where your interest will naturally be directed because every what might we say, like connoisseur or specialist within a given area of knowledge loves all of the rare and exceptional types within that domain of knowledge, right? Um, You know, as uh, when it comes to musicians, right? I'm a musician myself. Um, Who do we study when we, um, maybe study is the wrong word, but who do we idolize? Who do we listen to? Who do we um, try and learn the way that they played? Well, it was all the exceptional and rare people, right? It's not the the average guy just playing an average um, at an average uh, proficiency at guitar in the bar on weekday nights that you care about, you know, studying or focusing your attention on. It's somebody like Django Reinhardt who lost two fingers and then become one of the greatest jazz guitarists of all time, right? Who overcame that sort of uh, um, limitation and turned it into a strength and stylistic characteristic of his playing. That's who interests you. But then, just like with musicians, what do we find? Oh, well, there's a little thing called the 27 Club, (laughs) where um, so many um, famous and talented people um, burn themselves out and die of a drug overdose or suicide or something of that nature uh, when they're very young, and they end up botched and destroyed by their own success. And it's almost uh, too painful to contemplate if you have a genuine um, care or love or affection or, or see the value in such such people. But as Nietzsche reminds us throughout this passage, often their lives were, what does he say, pieces of wretched minor fiction, that really the work itself is the success. So this applies just as much in the life of the, you know, the poets he mentions here, like Golgol or Lapardi. But it would also apply in the case of all of those, you know, quote unquote, higher men, right? Your Napoleons and your Caesars. That it is, in some sense, the great deeds they did and the, you know, political work that they underwent um, or the, the art of warfare that Napoleon practiced, that was his great work. And the fact that he, you know, fell from power and was exiled, that's just a piece of wretched minor fiction, right? It's Napoleon the artist that's important. And this is in some sense perhaps a consolation for this hypothetical born psychologist who is confronting this fact that all the the great exceptional individuals end up destroyed or ruined in some sense. And so to bring it back then to Jesus at the end, where he says, why pursue such painful matters, assuming one doesn't have to? I mean, much of what he says about Jesus is elaborated upon in the work The Antichrist. I would see this passage as sort of a preliminary to that. Psych- psychologizing Jesus and seeing him as a rather pathological uh, person who is obsessed with this idea of love and God's love and perfect love and you know human love is so wretched and p- pitiable and unknowing compared to the all-encompassing love of God 
and how he invents hell to put people there who do not wish to love him. And Nietzsche will analyze this further in the Antichrist, again, to give a sort of short explanation. The idea is that Jesus is um, obsessed or fixated on this idea of love because it is the apotheosis of the slave morality of not wanting to do harm to anyone, to be as harmless as possible. That he says that uh, Nietzsche says that Jesus was a type that was pathologically unable to give resistance to any kind of aggression or offense or evil or immorality. That turning the other cheek, resist not evil, is the ultimate expression of Jesus's morality. And so he, of course, creates a religion centered around the worship of love and this God of love. And, you know, Nietzsche earlier in the passage suggests how love has just generally been overestimated and um, even how we might even ignore the ways in which love, out of love, we might destroy the thing that we love. It might actually, love might lead us to do things which are greatly harmful toward the object of our desire. That, it, you know, if we're talking about real love, physiological love, love which is a tyrannical impulse, it's not, um, we have greatly exaggerated and embellished upon what love truly is, almost to the point where it has become this abstract metaphysical thing that, uh, you know, God's love is nothing like the kind of love that you might have for another human being in many ways. But in any case, uh, as Nietzsche has said elsewhere, where he thinks that if Jesus had lived a little bit longer, he would have repudiated his earlier ideas because he was noble enough for that. Well, I think this is the implication that Jesus was he, that he was a noble type of person, that he was an exceptional type of person. And of course, he was exceptional, right? He was exceptional in that he had a pathological hatred for reality, an instinctual hatred for the entire physical, sensuous reality, to the point of simply denying its existence. And that is exceptional. Nietzsche points out that his followers, the subsequent Christians, we're not like this on the inside, right? They uh, were, he says that there was only one true Christian and he died on the cross and that was Jesus. Now he was exceptional in a way that was perhaps, um, again, as Nietzsche would have called it pathological, but still an exception and a botched one, one that was ruined and destroyed by the uh, collective, by the, the, the herd around him. And, we can see that it's like he has this temptation to pity for these types of people, even when it comes to Jesus. Um, and yet, uh, why pursue such painful matters in a, in a sense? And that is, you know, it takes us back to Nietzsche's whole critique of suffering, which the German word is mitleid, or mitleid um, which literally means suffering with. And perhaps this is a rather trite way to put it, but your pity does not help anything. <laughs> it's, uh, you know, that happened a long time ago. There's nothing you can do about it. When you read about an exceptional person who is uh, destroyed or ruined, you feeling pity for them uh, simply doesn't do anything except make you feel bad. <laughs> and I think to a lot of people, they might think it's a silly response to just say, just forget about it. Don't think about it. Right. That Because that, in many ways, that is actually Nietzsche's response. Forget about that. <laughs> don't think about that. Have your cures for that. Be, don't be tortured by your own memory, as he says the psychologist is. But um, I think there is something to this, that um, that's suffering that you're needlessly creating in, within your own mind that is entirely confined to your own mind and is entirely based on knowledge, lingering memories, things that are not, it's pain and suffering that's not here and now. It's not actually occurring. It's like being tormented over dragging a past of something happening. And a lot of Nietzsche's project is to point the way toward getting over those ponderous or heavy feelings, the spirit of gravity in so many, so many words. Let's go to 270, quote, the spiritual haughtiness and nausea of every man who has suffered profoundly, it almost determines the order of rank, how profoundly human beings can suffer his shuddering certainty, which permeates and colors him through and through, that by virtue of his suffering, he knows more than the cleverest and wisest could possibly know, and that he knows his way and has once been at home in many distant, terrifying worlds of which you know nothing, 
this spiritual and silent haughtiness of the sufferer, this pride of the elect of knowledge, of the initiated, of the almost sacrificed, finds all kinds of disguises necessary to protect itself against contact with obtrusive and pitying hands, and altogether against everything that is not equal in suffering. Profound suffering makes noble. It separates. End quote. So I think this is a passage which is greatly elucidated by knowing the background of Nietzsche's life and how he suffered profoundly, likely from a congenital defect throughout his life. We've gone over it many times, but the headaches, the nausea, vomiting, so on and so forth, uh, the loss of his eyesight, being unable to read and write uh, in, to an increasing degree as he got uh, older, and not wanting to be pitied for this, for this great suffering. And I think this gives Nietzsche a sort of insight into maybe a type that he has criticized, the martyrs and the ascetics, or the people who have endured profound suffering and the ways in which suffering makes them consequently profound. It creates a depth to their soul. And many people have remarked on this. You can like see in a face of a person who has suffered long and hard, a sort of deep insight or wisdom that maybe others don't have access to. And Nietzsche has said this in one of his unpublished notes. It's something in Will to Power, actually, I believe, or it can be found in the collection Will to Power, where Nietzsche says roughly the same thing, that um, it it's like a, a gateway into intellectual or philosophic, philosophical depth. And so, and they... <laughs> This is such a person, we might imagine a type of person like an ascetic or a martyr who has suffered long and terribly for some, and as a result, gleaned some, what they perceive to be deep truths about reality. They don't want, they want to protect themselves against contact with obtrusive and pitying hands, right? They don't want your pity. And I think Nietzsche feels a sort of common spirit with those types of people. And here it's funny. I mean, it's another way in which you could say maybe the holy man was an elevation of mankind because um, suffering profoundly, he says it almost determines the order of rank, how profoundly human beings can suffer. And this is another way in which Nietzsche rationalizes um, sort of the, the order of rank when it is politically instantiated is that he believes like the lower classes actually have less of a capacity for suffering than, you know, uh, whereas like the most noble soul, like you prick them ever so slightly and they bleed. Um, you know, we don't necessarily have to believe Nietzsche on this point. I think it's far more informative to think of the ways in which Nietzsche profoundly suffered in which this made him feel that he had, he had actually gained something or had been able to transform that into um, you know, like the alchemists say, into gold. And the idea of then pitying Nietzsche for his suffering, something that he was sort of uh, revolted by and thought was a very common experience. Uh, I don't mean like a very a, a low, a plebeian reaction to seeing somebody suffer because they could, in fact, have been made more profound by it. They might find their gold through that process. So who are you to pity them for it? Okay, uh, let's continue. Quote, one of the most refined disguises is Epicureanism and a certain ostentatious courage of taste which takes suffering casually and resists everything sad and profound. There are cheerful people who employ cheerfulness because they are misunderstood on its account. They want to be misunderstood. There are scientific men who employ science because it creates a cheerful appearance and because being scientific suggests a human being is superficial. They want to seduce others to this false inference. There are free, insolent spirits who would like to conceal and deny that they are broken, proud, incurable hearts. The cynicism of Hamlet, the case of Galliani. And occasionally, even foolishness is the mask for an unblessed, all-too-certain knowledge. From which it follows that it is characteristic of more refined humanity to respect the mask and not to indulge in psychology and curiosity in the wrong place. End quote. Um, this is one of those passages that I, it's almost uh, terrifying to take it on because there's so much compressed into just a few sentences. Broadly speaking, Nietzsche brings up the mask again. So he's, he's returning to this concept and 
he says it's almost that, it, or it would follow that it's characteristic of more refined humanity to respect the mask and not indulge in psychology and curiosity in the wrong place. And so this recalls his uh, coinage at the beginning of Twilight of Idols that perhaps psychology is a vice. Why is it a vice? Because you're peering behind the mere appearances and that there is something healthy about living in a world of mere appearances. That again, this is life's seduction to us forever to live within a world of illusion. Life will use any, uh, will have recourse to any illusions that it can use to induce us to continue with life. And that it's another way in which Nietzsche could be compared to Socrates, the figure that he has so much ridicule for, uh, right? The guy who wants to peer underneath the appearances of the noble uh, gentlemen of ancient Athens, the statesmen and poets and great military commanders who are you know, universally respected by the community. But when Socrates questions them, when he tries to see, okay, what's beneath this facade? What is it that, what wisdom do you actually have that allows you to um, so masterfully engage in the art of statecraft? Surely you know what is uh, what the good is, for example, if you're in charge of managing the good of the entire community. And of course, as we all know, what Socrates finds is they don't have answers for Socrates. In many cases, it is just purely a mere appearance and that um, people simply regurgitate things that they've been told. They repeat or recapitulate to the morality of the community that has been beaten into them uh, since time immemorial. They don't actually know the reasons for the things they do or the beliefs that they hold. Um, and so there is a sort of, what might we say, a health in respecting the mask and not wanting to peer underneath the mask even though that's what this whole book is, is Nietzsche appearing behind the mask and daring to lift his own mask. That This is Nietzsche's um, unprecedented honesty. And uh, just to finish out our interpretation of the passage where he talks about one of the refined disguises to protect a noble soul from those obtrusive and pitying hands is what? Epicureanism, um, in which... Uh, takes suffering casually and resists everything sad and profound. Um, again, if you want more information, go look at the episode on Epicurus and Epicureanism. I think that will be rather clear that the Epicurean in many ways is like the Buddhist. They accept a material world. They ex accept that the task of reducing suffering is the most important thing for living happily on earth. And that's their goal to live happily as possible during this transitory existence through this material realm. How do we do that? Well, don't think as much about things that are uh, sad and profound. Resist all of that. And that is actually very similar to the approach of, say, the Zen Buddhists of like, don't think to, uh, don't, you, you want to reach a state of don't know mind, not knowing about all these doctrines and many different things. Now, of course, practically speaking, they do learn about all these doctrines and, and all the complexities of Buddhist doctrine, but that, um, what you're actually aim the point of all that is to aim for a state where you're not thinking about anything and that this is almost, I mean, you could call it happiness, but it's almost like a state that's beyond happiness. It can't even be called that. And Nietzsche gives a couple other examples, but the point is that these are all masks or disguises or a front that we put up in order to hide from suffering or to forget our own suffering, to forget that we are broken, proud, incurable hearts. This is something we'd like to conceal and deny. Um, there are all sorts of means of doing this. And I think, therefore, the gist of the passage, in a way, is that noble um, repulsion or revulsion against the pity of others. That I think, first and foremost, if I were to psychologize Nietzsche, is why he rejects pity. He does not want to be pitied because... <laughs> And that is, I think, actually a very strong critique of pity, by the way, if we are just honest and we, like, again, lift the mask behind, uh, behind which we see the essence of what Nietzsche, where, where what Nietzsche is saying is coming from, right? Where, where Nietzsche is coming from on this, it's actually a very persuasive argument. Because a lot of people have a problem with Nietzsche's critique of pity. I'm like, okay, I kind of understand what he's saying, but, like, that, that, they find something uglier or repulsive themselves about like they imagine this completely unpitying individual. Like is the overman really supposed to be this unpitying sort of like ruler from on high who can just sort of use human lives how he sees fit? That's always kind of like this like evil dictator caricature of like what Nietzsche's philosophy would lead to. 
I think it's much simpler than that. And it would simply be to think of how you feel when you're pitied by someone else. And whether that's a good feeling. Do you want to be pitied? Do you feel that you're helped by the pity of others? And maybe there are some cases where some people would say, well, yes, if I I was down on my luck and if I hadn't been pitied by others who were willing to help me out, I would have, you know, uh, been completely financially ruined or perished or, you know, blah, blah, blah. I'm not saying that that's not possible. But I think especially if we consider the case of someone like Nietzsche, where there is no help that you can give him, right? Like imagine, because pity still exists there. And perhaps we might say pity is strongest there. The pity that you feel when there is someone who suffers and there's absolutely nothing you can do about it. And you're aware of that suffering and you pity them. You feel bad for them. And Nietzsche's point or a large part of his raison d'etre is pointing out, they don't want your pity. Your pity actually misunderstands the ways in which their suffering could, if they were able to, to to use it for this purpose, transform them into something better. And if you were actually pitied, you would not like that. You wouldn't feel that it was helpful to you. You wouldn't want others to pity you if you were in a, what we would call a pitiable position, a pitiful position or something like that. And so I think that's a very strong argument. Let's go to 271. Quote, what separates two people most profoundly is a different sense and degree of cleanliness. What avails all decency and mutual usefulness and goodwill toward each other. In the end, the fact remains, they can't stand each other's smell. The highest instinct of cleanliness places those possessed of it in the oddest and most dangerous lonesomeness as saints, for precisely the saintliness, the highest spiritualization of this instinct. Or sorry, precisely this is saintliness, the highest spiritualization of this instinct. Whether one is privy to someone's indescribable abundance of pleasure in the bath, or whether one feels some ardor or thirst that constantly drives the soul out of the night into the morning, and out of the dim and dark moods into what is bright, brilliant, profound, and refined, just as such a propensity distinguishes, it is a noble propensity, it also separates. The saint's pity is pity with the dirt of what is human all too human, and there are degrees and heights where he experiences even pity itself as a pollution, as dirty. End quote. So this returns to Nietzsche's observation that many of the religious practices of the saint, many of his prohibitions and bans and abstinences are essentially hygienic practices. This is their origin physiologically and in history. That quite literally in past ages, the saint was a cleaner person. Why? Well, because he didn't eat meat. He didn't eat, uh, he didn't drink alcohol or any kind of intoxicants. He didn't associate with, uh, you know, the opposite gender. He didn't handle money. Uh, and, you know, that all of these, all of these abstinences eventually took on a spiritual meaning, but that at first they were very, very literal. The saint was quite literally a cleaner person. And this propensity distinguishes but it also separates. And that was the, you know, we can see that very clearly in India with the Brahmin caste and their whole conception of their cleanliness. And who are the the lowest caste in the um, Indian caste system are the untouchables, the people who handle the most unclean, dirty things in a physical sense, right? Corpses and waste disposal. And so, and their whole caste system was based upon basically levels of how cleanly you are as a person being kept away from the uncleanly people. And so just from a descriptive anthropological account, what Nietzsche is saying here, I would say seems to, uh, seems to stack up, but, um, what does he say? Uh, he, he, he then compares this indescribable abundance of pleasure in the bath or whether somebody, uh, is always driven out of their dim and dark moods into what is bright, brilliant, profound, and refined. So this is sort of what we might call like a spiritual cleanliness, whether they choose to constantly fixate and meditate upon, say, for example, God's love, God's perfect love for mankind, to flee away from their dark and dim moods. We might say the kind of 
strange, wicked, questionable thoughts that Nietzsche has, right? Where one starts to look at what they see with their own eyes in nature and say, huh, this seems like an immoral or amoral world where everything's just eating each other to survive. And we're like seduced to these illusions in order to continue the samsaric cycle going, right? No, don't fixate on that. Think about this um, otherworldly ideal or something of that nature. That would be the direct analogy within the saintly type. But Again, I guess the point I'm trying to draw out here is that Nietzsche brings up cleanliness in a very literal sense, which is the way that the saintly type emerges historically, in his opinion, but that this also corresponds to a type of mental state. There is a saintly state of mind, we might say, just like there's like an aristocratic state of mind or a plebeian state of mind or so on and so forth. Um, and yet again, he's continuing on this um, Late motif of pity, which colors the second half of this uh, chapter, which I think also it corresponds very neatly with the end of Thus Book Zarathustra, these meditations on pity. Okay, 272, quote, Signs of nobility, never thinking of degrading our duties into duties for everybody, not wanting to delegate, to share one's own responsibility, counting one's privileges and their exercise among one's duties. End quote. So, very short passage, but I think very informative. Not wanting to share one's responsibilities, not wanting to turn one's duties. So we might say the responsibility or obligations that one feels in one's heart, um, which could be inseparable, physiologically speaking, from just say a strong tyrannical feeling. One says like, this is just the, this is the commandment that God put in my heart. And I have to obey it. This is the the dictate of my heart that I have a duty to obey. But you would never take that and universalize it and say everyone has an obligation to fulfill these same duties that I do. That is nobility. That's the noble state of mind. Being individual and not universalizing those responsibilities that you feel to everyone else. Because what is it to do that? Well, it's the attempt to take what is in you and say, well, this must be made common. This must be made universal. This must be imposed on everyone. Uh, this is what Nietzsche says about Kant, right, earlier in the text. And so um, the desire not to take what is peculiar and irreducibly individual to you and make it common, that is one way of describing the noble state of mind. It's a sign of one's nobility. 273, quote, A human being who strives for something great considers everyone he meets on his way either as a means or as a delay and obstacle or as a temporary resting place. His characteristic high-grade graciousness toward his fellow men becomes possible only once he has attained his height and rules. Impatience and his consciousness and that until then he is always condemned to comedy, for even war is a comedy and conceals, just as every means conceals the end spoil all of his relations to others. This type of man knows solitude and what is most poisonous in it. End quote. Uh, I think a fairly self-explanatory passage in terms of what Nietzsche is saying, but just to psychologize Nietzsche a bit, I think this might be his way of explaining how some people that he might consider exceptional uh, occasionally <laughs> do not display that sort of noble grace and um, noble temperament that he has described elsewhere in the work, that they can become mean-spirited, vulgar, uh, when they have not attained their ends. This is perhaps one of the ways in which they face ruination, just as a consequence of living among the rule, or living under the rule of the rule, <laughs> to use that word in two different sense senses. But um, I think that's perhaps Nietzsche's intention in writing this passage. Let's go to 274, quote, The problem of those who are waiting. It requires strokes of luck and much that is incalculable if a higher man in whom the solution of a problem lies dormant is to get around to action in time, to eruption, one might say. In the average case, it does not happen, and in nooks all over the earth sit men who are waiting, scarcely knowing in what way they are waiting, much less that they are waiting in vain. Occasionally the call that awakens that accident which gives the permission to act comes too late when the best youth and strength for action has already been used up by sitting still 
and many have found to their horror that they leaped up when they leaped up, excuse me, that their limbs had gone to sleep and their spirit had become too heavy. It is too late, they said to themselves, having lost their faith in themselves and henceforth forever useless. Could it be that in the realm of the spirit, Raphael without hands, taking this phrase in the widest sense, is perhaps not the exception, but the rule. Genius is perhaps not so rare after all, but the 500 hands it requires to tyrannize the kairos, the right time, seizing chance by its forelock. End quote. So it's not that genius is rare, but the 500 hands it requires to seize the right moment. Uh, and so to explain that line, Raphael without hands, Kaufman has a footnote here that uh, states it's an allusion to the oft-quoted sentence from Lessing's Amelia Galotti, Act 1, Scene 4, which goes as follows, quote, Do you think, my prince, that Raphael would not have been the greatest artistic genius if he had been born by some misfortune without hands? End quote. And so th this goes back to the 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 question of the misfortune at Einstein, right? The person with the Einstein level scientific genius who happens to be born in the lower strata of society and never has access to the education that allows him to ever manifest those talents. And he just dies poor and obscure, perhaps never even knowing that he would have had this genius or talent. Although likely they would, uh, I think Nietzsche would, would argue that any sort of exceptional person would be perhaps even starkly aware of how different they are from everyone else around them. And this is part of what ruins them. But I think this passage is great for concretizing exactly what he's talking about, of how so many, um, so many great and exceptional people might not turn out well, what he means by that. And what he, what he means quite literally is you could be a Raphael born without hands. And he says he's using this in the widest possible sense. So this is by analogy. There are hundreds if not thousands or millions of ways in which this could play out, where you do have a particular talent or genius, but you never have the means to realize it. And that furthermore, to be a truly great or exceptional individual, he says, you need the, f the 500 hands, right? You need a Shiva amount of hands in order to really seize that opportunity because, you know, for everything, and what that means is everything has to line up for you exactly perfectly. Fate, fortune has to smile on you in a million little different ways, many of which you won't even perceive in order for you to be placed at exactly the right place and exactly the right time uh, in order for your genius to manifest. And that's why the vast majority of exceptional people is simply a failed experiment in so many words. And so, you know, what happens to the vast majority of them is they spend their lives waiting for some opportunity. When they finally leap up, they find that their limbs have gone to sleep and the, the strength, the fire of youth is gone and the opportunity has passed them by. And there is, we could say that uh, in other passages, these are really the kind of people that Nietzsche, I would say, I think it's justified to link this type of person because he says that the early shamanic types of individuals who were the first religious type of men trying it's another one of his anthropological experiments trying to suss out how if not necessarily the slave morality but how the religious type would appear on earth and he talks about that earlier in this book as we've gone over but he also talks about it in the antichrist of the person who does have that genius or that great potential but they've they were botched in some way and now they've they wait they were forced to wait too long and they never expended their will to power on living and so you just have this powerful soul that is facing down you know old age sickness and death as their only reality their only future and they become these sort of like gloomy terrifying figures within the community the shaman right the man who lives on the edge between uh, this world and the next. And that's sort of like one of Nietzsche's potential explanations for the origin of the saintly or the religious type is the great person who went past their prime. And then therefore they have a sort of depressive outlook on the world and on life. Um, and because they have nowhere to, to spend their spirit on, um, or no, or no means of doing that except in inventing this other world and, you know, uh, disseminating, therefore, then these ideas which are distrustful or suspicious of life and suspicious of health and suspicious of beauty. Oh, this world is simply a fleeting thing. And uh, as 
you are now, I once was, and as I am now, you will become, right? Oh, you're, you're enjoying your life and health and, and youth and vitality now, but remember, you'll become sickly and old and die just like is going to, you know, just like I'm becoming, right? Um, and that that's sort of one of the origins of the religious type. Um, and so I think that's relevant here as well. Let's go to 275, quote, Anyone who does not want to see what is lofty in a man looks that much more keenly for what is low in him and mere foreground, and thus betrays himself, end quote. And I'm fairly certain we've discussed this aphorism in the past, um, or maybe just one very similar to it. I think it's fairly straightforward, but it says something about Nietzsche's psychological approach that those of us who only have what is common within us are only going to see the common in other individuals. We're only going to want to see that or perhaps only be able to see that. And so when we see a great or exceptional individual, we are going to find what is common in the foreground, that piece of wretched minor fiction that constitutes the all the flaws that they had or all of the vices which they had or all the ways in which they succumbed to that which was common all the ways in which they were botched by um you know all the factors and environment around them and that says more about ourselves than it does about them uh, we want to see what is human all too human in the great individual that almost constitutes like the main attraction in many like if you think about like a, a biopic or a sort of a biographical film about a great and important person, we always want to see what are the salacious details of their lives, what are the ways in which they were just like me, actually. And uh, that is a need that we have. It's not. It's more informative about us than the person whose life we're interpreting. That's the way in which we betray ourselves. 276, quote, in all kinds of injury and loss, the lower and coarser soul is better off than the noble one. The dangers for the latter must be greater. The probability that it will come to grief and perish is actually, in view of the multiplicity of the conditions of life, tremendous. In a lizard, a lost finger is replaced again. Not so in man. End quote. And uh, again, I think this is just a recapitulation to the idea that the, the rule recurs eternally. The last man recurs eternally. The mediocre type is the eternal type, and the noble soul being so individual and so peculiar, the exceptional being, by that very nature, an exception, whenever that type perishes, it's a great loss because it may never come again. Nothing like it may ever arise again. So I don't think he's speaking about, you know, uh, the... The, the loss in the loss, the lower and coarser soul on the individual physical material level is actually better off in losing to the stronger type or whatever. I think he's saying in terms of the type itself, the mediocre type is never destroyed or gotten rid of, right? So long as the species endures, because that's what the whole premise of the species is. But all of those rare exceptions um, are infinitely more valuable because they are, you know, they're like flashes of lightning. They're here and then they're gone. 277, quote, Bad enough, the same old story. When one has finished building one's house, one suddenly realizes that in the process, one has learned something that one really needed to know in the worst way before one began. The eternal, distasteful, too late. The melancholy of everything finished. End quote. And Kaufman says this may signal the approaching end of the book. There's sort of a shift in tone here. Um, I'm not sure if that's true so much, but it is a reminder that we are um, we are towards the end of the work. And the melancholy of everything finished, the eternal distasteful too late, these are very real feelings for any artist, writer, musician. I felt this with almost every album I've made. You get to the end, or every book that I've written, you know, you, you get to the end and then you have what can only be described as regrets. And it's usually because you didn't realize something or you didn't know something when you started. And as Nietzsche talks about building one's house, it's like if you have problems with the foundation of your house, it's going to affect the whole house. It, your foundation needs to be, um, you know, it can't have any major problems with it or it's going to affect the entire structure. And we might liken some of those missed 
premises or ideas or something of that nature, or just things you never thought to do, or that you, you maybe you were a little bit um, uncomfortable with, but you think, eh, that's fine. Kind of, I, I'll relate it to music again, because it's the easiest analogy for myself, but where you think, oh, that guitar tone isn't quite what I want it to be, but it'll be fine. With all the guitars on it, and uh, the bass and drums and the vocals, it'll be fine. And then you know, years down the line, you can still hear the ways in which that guitar tone isn't satisfactory because you didn't fully appreciate the ways in which that was a crack in the foundation of the entire house. And so in relation to Beyond Good and Evil, I mean, Nietzsche doesn't give us specifically what it is. Those ideas that he had to have realized before he started in order to not have that type of artistic regret. And we can see why this is bad enough for Nietzsche because regret is a very un-Nietzschean feeling. Right, uh, the desire to go back and do things differently, because really Nietzsche's taste is more for appreciating the ways in which previous mistakes or shortcomings or downfalls or what have you were ne- necessary in order to reach the point that we're at now. And so he, we see in this passage a struggle for Nietzsche to accept the ways in which his uh, mistakes or shortcomings or just things that he didn't know or things that he hadn't quite thought out yet and maybe didn't even know that he didn't know them, right? Those famous unknown unknowns of Donald Rumsfeld um, affected or warped or distorted the outcome of the structure beyond good and evil. That maybe there are thoughts or insights that he didn't come to until the very end that he wishes he could go back and restructure the entire work based on these and yet you can't right and and if he had scrapped the work and started over we would have lost a treasure of world literature and so we have to be grateful to nietzsche's mistakes as nietzsche himself also has to learn to be i mean i've told the story before but nietzsche initially wanted to destroy all of the copies of human all too human and the birth of tragedy and uh daybreak and the gay science and was convinced not to, and instead he decided to write new prefaces to all of these works, to recontextualize them within this process of Nietzsche learning and growing and becoming a thinker. Um, you know, he describes it as a process of convalescence, of getting well from the long illness of Wagnerianism and the uh, uh, Schopenhauerianism and the other ways in which his thought had been polluted by <laughs> things like metaphysics and morality and fatherlandishness, these things that are common. And he had to get over those as a sort of sickness. Um, And so he had to learn to accept that his earlier mistakes or the ways in which his early works were perhaps flawed, foundationally flawed. Nevertheless, without those, we'd never get here to Beyond Good and Evil. And even here in this work, Beyond Good and Evil, there are ways in which he would have done it differently. And this is just, again, I have to stress, it's just a reality of being a creative person. There is a melancholy to everything finished um, that I I feel this. Um, Okay, 278. Quote, Wanderer, who are you? I see you walking on your way without scorn, without love, with unfathomable eyes, moist and sad, like a sounding lead that has returned to the light, unsated from every depth. What did it seek down there? With a breast that does not sigh, with a lip that conceals its disgust, with a hand that now reaches only slowly. Who are you? What have you done? Rest here. This spot is hospitable to all. Recuperate. And whoever you may be, what do you like now? What do you need for recreation? Name it. Whatever I have, I offer to you. Recreation? Recreation? You are inquisitive. What are you saying? But give me, please. What? What? Say it. Another mask. A second mask. End quote. So Nietzsche brings back this character of the Wanderer. You remember the Wanderer? We talked about this character back in episode two, the entire podcast. And, you know, he appears in Human All to Human and the gay science at the Zarathustra is called the wanderer and then here and beyond good and evil. And the wanderer character is always brought up when Nietzsche is talking about, it's like at the intersection between wandering and rest 
is when the character of the Wanderer enters into it. It's where Nietzsche has been wandering in forbidden country, as he says in Eke Homo. This is what philosophy is to him. Wandering through all of these questions on which the moralities of the world have set their ban. You cannot ask this question. You cannot think this thought. Your mind cannot go to this place. His philosophy is the act of going to these places. And never being satisfied, never settling and saying, okay, now we've found a stable, coherent, persisting identity. Never being satisfied that we have answered every question and that we can now rest in some garden of Armida, right? That metaphor for the garden of the enchantress that detains you. To that desire that even somebody like Nietzsche has to be detained and to stop, to cease from this in, endless quest of seeking and fall into that rest, to be seduced by the illusions that the collective wants to impose upon all of us. The, the mental framework that is offered to every psyche uh, by the herd in order to navigate and understand the world and have an easy uh, handed down to us understanding of our place in the world. There, there is an appeal to that that even Nietzsche feels. And so the wanderer often is lamenting that he, he simply cannot stop and rest and be detained within such a garden. He always has to keep going. And that's often the, the context of these passages where the wanderer appears. And this passage is written from somebody, I suppose, whatever is in Nietzsche that is pitying towards himself, saying, maybe rest here. This spot is hospitable to all. Rest just long enough to recuperate. And what do you, what is it that you want now that you're in your rest and recuperation? What do you need for recreation? Um, and what the wanderer answers is another mask, a second mask. And this passage is famously confusing for many people, but I think... So there is something that is very intuitive to glean in the idea that the recreation of the wanderer is the mask. And what does that mean? Well, in some sense that psychology is Nietzsche's vice, right? As a born psychologist, that in a very real sense for Nietzsche, to study someone's mask, so to speak, to study the way that they appear is to study them. That even though the appearance conceals, it betrays even more. And when you understand some of the basic principles of Nietzschean psychology, so to speak, you learn the ways in which the mask is a disguise or a compensation, um, the ways in which the manifestation of someone, the outward appearance, the way that they want to be perceived, tells you everything about them. But uh, in that the picking up all the different masks of the world, all the both the common ones and the exceptional ones, just like we might say in Twilight of Idols, sounding all, out all the various idols of the world, um, that the Wanderer's curse is that uh, even his recreation, even what he gets enjoyment out of, is always seeking after another mask. But it could have another meaning, though, insofar as what does he say that uh, the he's like a sounding lead that is returned to the light unsated from every depth. What did he seek down there? So the wanderer is never sated. Uh, it's in some sense, a, a folly or a farce, his great task that he set for himself. In some sense, it could only ever be a recreation because he's never gotten anywhere and, and so, like it, in some sense uh, I'm searching for the words but coming to like a final answer or ultimate answer is um, anathema to the wanderer's very way of being and so he can't ever come to completion with his task and perhaps his folly is that any quest for knowledge will always end in tragedy and failure and he's further removing himself from the immediate physical sensory reality by putting another mask on top of a mask, right? <laughs> that uh, you already have life itself is already in Nietzsche's estimation, appearance, mere appearance. And 
the conceptual linguistic discursive world is an appearance on top of mere appearance. It's a dream on top of a dream. And it, we could liken this to placing a second mask over your initial mask. Um, but I'm not going to claim to have the authoritative interpretation of this passage because it is a bit obscure. And I think there's a sort of perhaps maybe a poetic meaning to the passage that doesn't need to be philosophically disentangled. But I guess just for the for our purposes, I'm trying to find the ways in which we could relate this to his broader philosophical um, project in Beyond Good and Evil. Uh, 279, quote, Men of profound sadness betray themselves when they are happy. They have a way of embracing happiness as if they wanted to crush and suffocate it from jealousy. Alas, they know only too well that it will flee. End quote. That is a beautiful passage that I, I don't have any words for because there's really nothing to say about it. Um, <laughs> I think uh, it's too, it's too elegant. 280. Quote, too bad. What? Isn't he going back? Yes, but you understand him badly when you complain. He's going back like anyone who wants to attempt a big jump. End quote. And I think this is the way in which Nietzsche talks about a return to nature, how some of his great men in the political sense are like an atavism or a throwback, the ways in which he looks back to the ancient Greeks, the ways in which he looks back to the Renaissance. He uh, recognizes the power and the strength of tradition and the old religions, the old uh, superstitions and old metaphysics. And yet he points out here, as he does all the way back in chapter one, that um, when he's criticizing some types uh, or, or he gives them sort of like backhanded praise where he says, what I respect about them, the people who are cynical about these modern ideas is where, not where, where they want to go, which is back, but where they want to get is away. And with a little more strength, they would be able to rise into something new. And so this is Nietzsche, I think, once more pointing out, this is a prelude to a philosophy of the future. He wants to go forward. I've called Nietzsche a reactionary many times, but properly speaking, he actually isn't because he doesn't want to go back to anything. The ways in which he uses uh, or draws upon uh, the past and past ways of life and past mores is in order to trigger this perspectivist flip in our experience and our approach to metaphysics and morality and our place of being in the world, however we want to say it. Um, to understand the contingency of these things and the perspectival nature of these things, which necessarily leads one to the psychological approach to philosophy and the pursuit of knowledge. And from there, once we recognize many of our moral dogmas as being of a psychological origin and begin to attempt to study life as dispassionately as possible and, and understand where our morality comes from, from a naturalistic angle, um, we come to these terrible sort of hard truths. One of which is, for example, as we talked about earlier in this episode, the idea of cognition itself as an artifact of the common consciousness. And uh, all of our intellectual world of um, rational discursive thought as tending toward these platonic illusions. Um, and so when you understand all of these things, that's like a Nietzsche taking a few steps back, like we might imagine somebody getting a running start for a great leap. All of these errors in our thought were drawing taught the bowl of the soul in order to shoot for something farther. And in some sense, just to, to, to jump to the end of the project, I mean, really, as Nietzsche said, you know, a lot of his ideas might seem like a novelty from a philosophical angle, but as like a primordial truth of like instinctive knowledge in the physical world, the physiological world, the biological world, it's the most mundane thing of all time. Uh, and that really the remarkable idea of Nietzsche's project is the notion of being able to be a conscious being, a being that remembers and has a sense of self and of time and um, has all of these gifts of the intellect that does not fall into these platonic illusions. Is that possible? And that Nietzsche thinks this is such 
an amazing transformation from what we are now. Um, being trapped in all these errors of thought because the consequences of abandoning them are just too terrifying for us. That someone who could actually confront that terrifying reality and then actually take that reality and say, this is good, I accept this, I say yes to this, that kind of person would be, they'd have to be superhuman. They would have to not be subject to these human alter human vices and faults and weaknesses and timidity. And so in a way, you could say that's a state of living or a kind of human being that's never existed on earth, this type of ideal that Nietzsche has, because whenever he has to look back to past examples, these are people who did live within illusions. We, he might have said more healthy illusions, but illusions nonetheless. And he doesn't want to go back to a time of illusions. What he imagines is a time at which mankind can say yes to life in full conscious awareness of what that means. Uh, consciousness becoming healthy and life affirming. Uh, philosophy becoming something which is life affirming. And that is the nature of his great leap into the future, I think. And so he's not a conservative or a reactionary. Um, he's not just a traditionalist who wants to re revive Greek paganism. Greek paganism had many things about it which Nietzsche thought were life-affirming and healthy, but ultimately his eye is fixed on the future. Okay, we're going to go to 281. Quote. Oh, and I should say, this whole passage is in quotes. So, Presumably, somebody who is not Nietzsche himself is speaking. A character is speaking here. Quote, Will people believe me? But I demand that they should believe me. I have always thought little and badly of myself, only on very rare occasions, only when I had to, always without any desire for this subject, more than ready to digress from myself, always without faith in the result owing to an unconquerable mistrust of the possibility of self-knowledge, which went so far that even in the concept of immediate knowledge, which theoreticians permit themselves, I sensed a contradictio in ejecto. This whole fact is almost the most certain thing I do know about myself. There must be a kind of aversion in me to believing anything definite about myself. Does this perhaps point to a riddle? Probably, but fortunately none for my own teeth. Perhaps it betrays the species to which I belong, but not to me, and of that I am glad. End quote. And it's not clear to me entirely who this character is or why Nietzsche puts it in quotations. I almost wonder if it's in quotations to indicate that it is something perhaps a bit more personal about Nietzsche's self. This may, may be the shadow speaking, right? The um, Nietzsche's confession, the reflections, the self-reflections of his soul uh, when the wanderer is alone with himself. But um, I don't know, and I'll be honest about that. I'm not going to put forward a theory as to why it's in quotations. But the person described here, the person who is speaking, is someone who does seem to be of the philosophical type, and I can't help but think of the introduction to genealogy of morality, written right after this as a continuation of this book where Nietzsche says we are strangers to ourselves, men of knowledge. How could it be that we could ever know ourselves? And that, in some sense, this endless search for, you know, he describes it as like being like honeybees of the spirit, always trying to gather up our, our pollen or to make our honey, bring something home so that we can transform into something useful, right? That that's what we're like. We're going out and trying to find our treasure, in the world of ideas or in studying people or types of people, studying masks, studying the idols of the world. This is what interests us. And as a result, our, our searching of the spirit is always externalized rather than internalized is one way we, we, that we could put it. And we also might consider Nietzsche's criticisms of Descartes and Descartes' sense of immediate certainty, which Nietzsche puts immediate knowledge in scare quotes here, which theoreticians permit themselves, and he says he senses a contradiction in terms in this idea of immediate knowledge, right? Because what is knowledge but mediating? Knowledge, facts, conceptual thought based on, again, categories, arbitrary divisions, um, these concepts which are, you know, supposedly enduring and definite and so on and so forth are always mediating considerations 
between the immediate, which is the sense, the world of sensation, right? Sense data and response to it, physiological response, which is, um, you know, it, Nietzsche would argue in the purest sense, unbroken cause and effect, the doer and the deed united. We've talked about this all before, but immediate knowledge, therefore, is a contradiction in terms. We don't have any immediate intellectual certainty or uh, immediate certainties of knowledge because knowledge is always intermediary. And therefore, with this kind of view of the world and oneself as this dyna dynamic thing, which is not stable, not unitary, and most of all, not defined because as living things, life is transformation, right? And change. Um, you can't believe anything definite about yourself. And so this passage then represents perhaps this type of person, I mean, i.e. Nietzsche, applying their same psychology to themselves saying, why am I the type of person that has an aversion to believing anything definite about myself? And I think uh, that's about all that really needs to be said about the passage. We could go farther with this, but I think you can take it farther on your own with your own train of thought. 282, quote, But what happened to you? I don't know, he said hesitantly. Perhaps the harpies flew over my table. Nowadays it happens occasionally that a mild, moderate, reticent person suddenly goes into a rage, smashes dishes, upends the table, screams, raves, insults everybody, and eventually walks off, ashamed, furious with himself. Where? What for? To starve by himself? To suffocate on his recollection? If a person has the desires of a high and choosy soul and only rarely finds his table set and his food ready, his danger will be great at all times. But today, it is extraordinary. Thrown into a noisy and plebeian age with which he does not care to eat out of the same dishes, he can easily perish of hunger and thirst, or if eventually he falls to, after all, of sudden nausea. Probably all of us have sat at tables where we did not belong. Precisely the most spiritual among us, being hardest to nourish, knows that dangerous dyspepsia, which comes of a sudden insight and disappointment about our food and our neighbors at the table, the after-dinner nausea, end quote. So not as much to say about this passage, except that, well, there's two main things. For one, Nietzsche is continuing his point about the ways in which we might say someone who feels themselves to be separate or distant from everyone around them, who feels that gulf between themselves and what is common, can be uh, by forced to <laughs> not maintain that pathos of distance between themselves and what is common, lives in that sense of nausea, of being mismatched. Um, and, you know, again, it doesn't have to be like politically aristocratic or elitist. It's just simply enough as saying, I mean, like any kid who was an outsider or a loner, or I would even say most teenagers has probably felt this way. The day when you're, you know, like in high school sitting down at the lunch table and you look around at everyone around you with their mundane concerns and their laughter at the simplest jokes and uh, their like superficial like fixations on whatever popular thing is going on right now and their stupid opinions on all the, you know, current events and just felt like, wow, I'm just so different from everyone around me. Right. And so in a way, <laughs> what I'm doing here is actually rather subversive because I'm showing the ways in which it's very common to feel exceptional, um, which is me being very tricky. And by the way, to be, give you my own personal slip of the mask, that's often what I do on this podcast in order to, uh, try and seduce you to see things from Nietzsche's point of view. And I think there is something, <laughs> there is something about that very idea of trying to make the feeling of being exceptional common, trying to put it in terms that anyone can understand. That is the perhaps uh, terrible contradiction at the heart of Nietzsche's work and the greatest challenge to conveying his ideas. And I think a lot of the struggles that he's having at the end of this book and why seemingly he starts out 
um, talking about all this stuff and, you know, you might see it as like aristocratic political philosophy at the beginning of this chapter, most of what we talked about last week, versus a lot of these aphorisms, which Kaufman says the latter half feel more personal. Well, the uniting thread and why I began, like I divided the episodes the way I did and began with the aphorism I did, is that the very world of concepts is common and that Nietzsche is attempting to speak in the world of concepts to the what he thinks is a primordial truth that life itself is rank ordered is hierarchical is based on this pathos of distance is always uh justified by this exception right so he's trying to teach the philosophy of the exception which is in some sense always going to be impossible or self-contradictory because to do so you have to use um, if you're doing so in language, right, <laughs> if you're trying to communicate that idea, you're doing that via common means. And anyway, that takes us a little bit far afield, but I think it's a, it, it's an insight that I think helps tie together this entire last chapter and sort of maybe the aspects of it that seem disjointed or contradictory or need to struggling with this central problem. And in any case, the other aspect of 282 that I wanted to talk about as he talks about a mild, moderate, reticent person suddenly going into a rage and screaming and raving and insulting everyone, and then eventually walks off ashamed and furious with himself. And I think this is the way in which uh, the world of drives, of competing tyrannical drives, which are not identical, right? They're all within us, and yet their aims can be mutually exclusive. Their own internal logic and way of being can be so mutually exclusive and hostile with one another. And occasionally one of those drives surfaces that is not part of the, um, the character that someone has attempted to cultivate or the mask that they've attempted to create for themselves. And so it's, it's a, it's a way in which that, uh, raw, cruel reality of life of this, uh, bella omnium contra omnis emerges even insofar as we attempt to live in this very English manner, we might say, <laughs> a mild, moderate, reticent manner as these predictable, coherent, well-mannered uh, individuals with a unitary sort of character, an ego consciousness with a voluntarily governing free will. And then what happened to you, right? When you lose control, you go into a rage. Well, the idea of the voluntarily governing free will doesn't really have an explanation for this. So we, um, you know, when you, for you, it, for you to say like, I don't know why I did that, or I don't know what came over me is to say, I don't feel like I freely made that choice. That doesn't fit with my character, with the kind of, uh, way of life or way of being I've tried to manifest in the world. This doesn't make any sense. Well, how could that be? How could you not know why you made a decision or why you did something or feel like a different person was doing it? Um, and so I think there's an aspect of that in this passage of the, the war of all against all that, that the reality that we are these competing drives forcefully emerging into our consciousness occasionally and, uh, the ways in which that's like a break in this platonic idea of ourselves. Let's go to 283 quote. It involves subtle and at the same time, noble self-control, assuming that one wants to praise at all if one always praises only where one does not agree. For in the other case, one would, one would, after all, praise oneself, which offends good taste. Still, this kind of self-control furnishes a neat occasion and provocation for constant misunderstandings. To be in a position to afford this real luxury of taste and morality, one must not live among dolts of the spirit, but rather among people whose misunderstandings and blunders are still amusing, owing to their subtlety, or one will have to pay dearly for it. He praises me, hence he thinks I am right. This asinine inference spoils half our lives, sorry, spoils half our life for us hermits, for it leads asses to seek our neighborhood and friendship, end quote. And this type of sentiment goes all the way back to human to human Nietzsche with his idea that uh, convictions are more dangerous enemies of the truth than lies, and that it's quite one thing to have... Um, strength in one's convictions, but it is quite another to have strength for an attack on one's convictions. And just as earlier in the work, Nietzsche talked about how it's such a wonderful thing to have one's antipodes. When one 
somebody comes along like M. Renan with his uh, characterization of the religious mindset to so perfectly encapsulate the antipodal position to Nietzsche's, to be this mouthpiece for the opposite valuation, the opposite perspective and way of seeing things. Sometimes that is so incredibly valuable and, and you might have great praise for that person, but that doesn't mean you think that they're correct. And similarly, there might be people that you nominally or marginally agree with, or, or we might just say like, you would agree with their conclusions in many ways, but you find that their entire mode of arguing or their reasons for coming to those conclusions are contemptible or backwards or foolish. Um, and that there is something, he says, it's, real, it's a le- real luxury of taste and morality to live among people who you can find their, bl- their own blunders and mistakes amusing, kind of people that you can disagree with, with still great admiration, or um, not have to praise them in order to agree with them. And in the other case, he says it would be bad taste to praise oneself. So if you're only praising people with whom you agree, then surely you must praise yourself most of all for having found all the right opinions. And again, just to psychologize Nietzsche, this kind of contrarian attitude and finding the most admiration, perhaps, where he disagrees with people, figures like Socrates, right? Um, I think this is one of those character traits of Nietzsche's that allows him to write a book like this in the first place. Um, and that much of this book is an exercise in contrarianism and presenting ourselves with, to say it again, those strange, wicked, questionable questions. Seeing that as a worthwhile thing to do. Nietzsche is perhaps uniquely suited as a type to write such a book like that, because this is his attitude. Let's go to 284. Quote, to live with tremendous and proud composure, always beyond, to have and not to have one's affects, one's pro and con at will, to condescend to them for a few hours, to seat oneself on them as on a horse, often as on an ass, for one must know how to make use of their stupidity as much as of their fire, to reserve one's 300 foregrounds, also the dark glasses, for there are cases when nobody may look into our eyes, still less into our grounds, and to choose for company that impish and cheerful vice courtesy, and to remain master of one's four virtues, of courage, insight, sympathy, and solitude. For solitude is a virtue for us, as a sublime bent and urge for cleanliness which guesses how all contact between man and man in society involves inevitable uncleanliness. All community makes men, somehow, somewhere, sometime, common. End quote. And so I've already teased this out, but here we have it yet again. It's not all community makes men common. And it's right there etymologically in the word as to why that would be. And so it's funny because you could interpret some of Nietzsche's other aphorisms here of like this desire for cleanliness of like what he's only saying he wants to dine with princes and noblemen. Well, he might find them to be among the most common people, spiritually speaking, certainly during this time. I mean, one of the things that uh, really put him off about the Bayreuth festival that of the Wagnerians was all these like princes and nobility and high society people there that Nietzsche, uh, we know from his letters, kind of despised and looked down on. And so really he, the last virtue that he lists here, solitude, this is a virtue because it allows us to separate ourselves from that conceptual net of consciousness. And that's the only true way to be individual, um, to be peculiar, to be your own person, to think your own thoughts for once, to actually confront those wicked uncomfortable questions without feeling like you must have recourse to these ready-made answers that the collective approves of. And courage, insight, sympathy, solitude. So we, we talked about these Nietzschean virtues, I believe, at the end of last season. But it's worth noting, on, in the chapter on virtue in this work, he doesn't enumerate virtues like this. And so the implication here in this rather more personal section of the work is that in the sense that a noble person doesn't want to universalize their duties and responsibilities and obligations to everyone and make them common, 
Nietzsche doesn't, you know, in the chapter, Our Virtues, outline, these are the virtues of the free spirit. We must be courageous. We must be insightful and sympathetic, and we must seek solitude. He doesn't say all that. There is no thou shalt not or thou shalt in all of Nietzsche's work because that is the impulse to make your virtues, your duties, your obligations of your heart common. And uh, so much of the beginning of this passage is just sort of this reiteration, which frankly it verges on fetishizing the noble soul at many ways and definitely greatly idealizing to a point that might be distasteful for many people. But nevertheless, there is an aspect of this that is, um, Nietzsche is writing with the awareness that these are, um, as he said earlier in the work, his truths, these are his virtues. And we may notice that all of them incline the individual in some way or another, against the common. Um, so solitude to keep oneself away from all of these unclean ideas of the herd and of modernity around you. Sympathy, so being able to not be sucked into this vulgar for or against or love or hate, um, but being able to um, regard the world from the perspective of others. This is this, this psychological attitude, insight, um, I think that, that goes without saying. Um, and then courage, the, the courage not to have recourse to the, a metaphysical safety blanket or moral safety blanket. Um, the courage to live outside of the community, up in the ice and the mountain peaks. All right, uh, 285, quote, The greatest events and thoughts, but the greatest thoughts are the greatest events, are comprehended last the generations that are contemporaneous with them do not experience such events. They live right past them. What happens is a little like what happens in the realm of stars. The light of the remotest stars comes last to men, and until it has arrived, man denies that there are stars there. How many centuries does a spirit require to be comprehended? That is a standard, too. With that, too, one creates an order of rank and etiquette that is still needed for spirit and star. End quote. And uh, Kaufman points out in his footnotes, Nietzsche has written, he's used this metaphor in other ways. Um, we could even say that in the, there's echoes of this in the death of God metaphor. But, uh, you know, the greatest events are comprehended last. The generations that live through these greatest events live right past them. And I think as a truism, I mean, or just an observation about life, I think there's a great deal to this insofar as we don't really comprehend the significance of a great event or like when an era begins or ends, right? This is all retrospective in some sense. And how many centuries does a spirit require to be comprehended? Um, and he says there's an order of rank here too, implying or an order of rank is still needed, perhaps implying these most profound among great spirits will not be comprehended until much, much later. Right, the true significance of the greatest events, they'll be sort of the heaviest, the deepest, the most. The most has to be fathomed with them. And I think this is the way in which uh, philosophers like Nietzsche live as posthumous men. And Nietzsche's whole work here is aimed toward the future. Imagine writing for a, a future audience saying outright from the beginning that my contemporaries do not understand me. And, and Nietzsche thinks he is a great event, that his thoughts, the greatest thoughts are the greatest events, and that his thoughts are among the greatest. I mean, he says in the Antichrist that we should, perhaps we should stop calculating from the birth of Christ and begin uh, calculating from the death of Christianity. Stop calculating the calendar, right? The years from the beginning of Christianity, but from its end, and that the end is the arrival of Nietzsche and, and his work, right? Which is at least as arrogant as Hegel, sort of suggesting that he is like the the revel the full revelation of the meaning of philosophy and knowledge on earth, right, comes with Hegel himself, uh, which of course he would have to for his entire phenomenology to to be correct. So um in many ways this is a, a capitulation to the the psychology of the philosopher, posthumous men who see themselves as great events. But there is a there are ways in which this passage informs uh, other observations throughout Nietzsche's work or other ideas throughout Nietzsche's work. 286, quote, Here the vision is free, 
the spirit exalted. But there is an opposite type of man that is also on a height and also has free vision, but looks down. End quote. Um, and that is, it is a bit of a difficult passage to understand. I must confess to using Kaufman to help me understand it because he points out that line is from the end of Faust, where Faust is ascending to heaven. And Kaufman says, quote, this aphorism makes little sense unless one recognizes the quotation and knows that Dr. Marianus thus leads up to his apostrophe to the queen of heaven. One may wonder whether it could be possibly, whether it could possibly be noble to insist so often that one is looking down but at least Nietzsche does not purport to speak of himself, end quote. Um, and, you know, Kaufman, again, is always trying to safeguard Nietzsche against this, like, aristocratic rat radicalism charge, really like the fascism charge, which could be sort of tied in with that kind of political ideology. And he's seeing, like, looking down from a height as being necessarily elitist, when I don't think that's what Nietzsche's saying at all. Again, it is, when you have that bird's eye perspective, you see more, you see a more complete picture. And there's a way in which, Right when you you see like the entire picture of humanity, the entire story of all life from a height, perceive the whole that it redeems all of those little uh, you know all of those pieces of wretched minor fiction right carried out in all the little nooks and crannies of life that from the perspective of one down below that's all there is that's the whole reality right that's my own personal hardships and my life is mo the most important thing ever greater than the fall of empires. Whereas uh, Nietzsche might say that's like sort of like a plebeian perspective. Whereas the noble perspective is the one who wants to go up onto the height and perceive the whole, see the, the entire pattern, see the meaning of the entire system or the entire process as it were, and understand that. And, um, and so the vision is free, the spirit exalted. Um, we could say that the ending, the imagery of Faust is the elevated soul, the one who's being raised up by the uh, God or the Holy Spirit. And he's also looking up to God and the Holy Spirit, to this great spiritual realm. And Nietzsche's idea is a person who's raised up to a height, who looks down to the, their eye is still fixed on the world, on that which is material, physical, biological. So I, I don't know. I think at times Kaufman is like, he has got just this, this hair trigger desire to defend Nietzsche against these interpretations. And he misses the ways in which um, that really has nothing to do with Nietzsche's point here, looking down from a height. I mean, yes, it is, it is about like being above petty concerns and the, the kind of person who could do that, who could take in, the entirety or like if not the entirety as a monism right but be able to um just see the ways in which all these little um this is hard because we're describing all reality right but uh when he's talking about the philosopher uh the philosophical type in his pre-platonic lectures nietzsche says the task of the philosopher is to give an explanation for universal existence in the form of concepts right the kind of person who can do that does have to be, in some sense, above petty personal concerns, partisan politics and uh, current events and so on and so forth, because these are sort of, uh, they're not actually that important in the grand scheme of things. And so this, there is something about being untimely, about being living on a height or living in solitude, which is quote unquote elitist, right? But not in like this vulgar political sense. It's in the sense of... Um, actually as a psychologist, a born psychologist who has this as their vice, who is actually fascinated and interested and takes our recreation and looking at the idols and the masks of the world and understanding the human animal, um, will have a better understanding the higher up of a vantage point they have, the more they are removed from these like petty concerns. And so uh, is that elitist? I mean, yes, but in a spiritual sense, I guess. Okay, 287. Quote, what is noble? What does the word noble still mean to us today? What betrays? What allows one to recognize the noble human being under this heavy overcast sky of the beginning rule of the plebs that makes everything opaque and leaden? It is not actions that prove him. Actions are always open to many interpretations, always unfathomable, nor is it works. Among artists and scholars today, one finds enough of those who betray by their works how they are impelled by a profound desire for what is noble, 
but just this need for what is noble is fundamentally different from the needs of the noble soul itself, and actually the eloquent and dangerous mark of its lack. It is not the works, it is the faith that is decisive here, that determines the order of rank. Take up again an ancient religious formula in a new and more profound sense, some fundamental certainty that a noble soul has about itself, something that cannot be sought, nor found, nor perhaps lost. The noble soul has reverence for itself, end quote. And so in the, the very basic sense, this passage simply re reiterates the idea that the master morality, that perspective, is self-creative, self-directed, internally uh, fecund. It's not external, or it's not based on a reaction to external circumstances. It's not reactive or secondary, or uh, we might say submitting to uh, what is outside of itself. It's not seeking for things which are outside of itself. And what it finds as its ideal, it finds within itself. And so there is something, I think, that is very simple about this passage to understand based on that. And so Nietzsche gives us yet another formulation for determining the order of rank, right? Where he said, well, we could almost, you know, just determine who suffers most profoundly to determine the order of rank. But here he gives us another possibility that it's this faith which is decisive, this faith in oneself, this reverence for oneself, not seeking for the sacred or the ideal outside of oneself. And, you know, among all the artists and scholars, where would we find someone like this? And I think just as in Nietzsche's time, if we look about at these types today, very rarely do we see somebody who has, uh, well, I mean, we do occasionally see people who do seem to worship themselves, but rarely does it seem justified. <laughs> Usually that's not out of this like, um, sort of like noble minded self reverence. It's usually just out of like hedonistic superficiality. But uh, maybe that's just me looking for what's in the foreground with all of our great people, right? Maybe that's what's common in me speaking. Um, all right, uh, let's continue. 288, quote, There are human beings who have spirit in an inevitable way. They may turn and twist as they please and hold their hands over their giveaway eyes, as if a hand did not give away secrets. In the end, it always will out that they have something they conceal, namely spirit. One of the subtlest means for keeping up the deception, at least as long as possible, and of successfully appearing more stupid than one is, which in ordinary life is often as desirable as an umbrella, is called enthusiasm, if we include what belongs with it, for example, virtue. For as Galliani, who should know, says, virtu est enthusiasme, or virtue is enthusiasm, end quote. And uh, I only have a brief remark on this, uh, insofar as I am one of those people who lives among, <laughs> well, we all are, aren't we? Like, aren't there just so many moralists all around us who will then get riled up into a frenzy about whatever current event or moral issue that they have? And oftentimes, uh, you don't even have to disagree with them to sort of see their ire get kicked up. Um, it bothers them more than anything if you just don't care. If you just remain quiet or just nod your head and say, oh, interesting or whatever, you don't seem to have an opinion, that can really bother some people. Um, because virtue or, you know, really, it's one of those those examples of the unity of thing in itself and appearance for Nietzsche, right? Because um, if somebody is enthusiastic, that is the proof of the case in and of itself that they... Um, they really do. They really are devoted to this cause, or they really do identify with this particular um, moral code or virtue or whatever. I'm again struggling to put this into general terms, but um, so one of the subtlest means for keeping up the deception and successfully appearing more stupid than one is, which in ordinary life is often as desirable as an umbrella. So it's practical to appear to be one of them, to be common is to be able to replicate the enthusiasm with which the common person expresses uh, whatever beliefs or assertions they find to be virtuous. Let's go to 289. Quote, In the writings of a hermit, one al always also hears something of the echo of the desolate regions, something of the whispered tones and furtive look of solitude. 
in his strongest words, even in his cry, there still vibrates a new and dangerous kind of silence, of burying something in silence. When a man has been sitting alone with his soul in confidential discord and discourse, year in and year out, day and night, when in his cave, it may be a labyrinth or a gold mine, he has be become a cave bear or a treasure digger or a treasure garden dragon. Then even his concepts eventually require a peculiar, sorry, eventually acquire a peculiar twilight color, an odor just as much of depth as of must, something incommunicable and recalcitrant that blows at every passerby like a chill. The hermit does not believe that any philosopher, assuming that every philosopher was first of all a hermit, ever expressed his real and ultimate opinions in books. Does one not write books precisely to conceal what one harbors? Indeed, he will doubt whether a philosopher could possibly have ultimate and real opinions, whether behind every one of his caves there is not, must not be, another deeper cave a more comprehensive, stranger, richer world beyond the surface, an abysmally deep ground behind every ground, under every attempt to furnish grounds. Every philosophy is a foreground philosophy. That is a hermit's judgment. There is something arbitrary in his stopping here to look back and look around, in his not digging deeper here but laying his spade aside. There is also something suspicious about it. Every philosophy also conceals a philosophy. Every opinion is also a hideout, every word also a mask." End quote. This is one of my favorite passages, and you know, the beginning, the first half of it kind of reads like, again, Nietzsche bringing in this aspect of solitude as a virtue, and how solitude changes you and changes your thought, and makes you more conversant with the desolate regions of um, you know, the philosophical domain or however we want to poetically put it. But um, what he says at the end is, I think, best explained by cross-reference to a lot of the earliest sections of Beyond Good and Evil and the idea that the philosophy is an unconscious autobiography. That is the way in which a philosophy also conceals a philosophy. Every opinion is a hideout, every word a mask. The mask both reveals and conceals in its way. And in the way that somebody conceals, where they hesitate, they stop digging here, right? So Nietzsche says that, you know, in so many words, he's using the metaphor of digging, right? But where the philosopher really wants to get underneath all of these premises and assumptions behind this opinion and expose them for, you know, all the fallacies that undergird this particular philosophical idea, but then they don't do it for another one, right? Maybe it's the one that they, that they needed, that they found necessary for their lives, that was an untruth that they found necessary for life, and so they don't dig too thoroughly underneath it. This reveals something. And whereas previous philosophers might have just said, well, they made a mistake here, or they made an error, Nietzsche says, well, no, but this tells us something about them as a person. This is the way in which your masks still reveal you. And in the way in which seeing every philosophy as this involuntary unconscious autobiography, which grows out of whatever moral or immoral germ that is the philosopher's true aim, um, uh, this is the way in which the entire cave or labyrinth or mine in which the philosopher digs conceals something even greater, deeper, more profound about them. Which again, the answer is in psychology. And Nietzsche says it's the hermit who will have this insight, who will be able to have this approach to philosophers. Somebody who has practiced the virtue of solitude will see the ways in which the mask reveals while it conceals. 290, quote, Every profound thinker is more afraid of being understood than of being misunderstood. The latter may hurt his vanity, but the former his heart, his sympathy, which always says, Alas, do you want to have as hard a time as I did? End quote. Um, this just reminds me of that anecdote about Nietzsche that I heard from Ken Games that you know, he came across two old Catholic women in Turin who asked him, oh, we've heard of you, which of your books should I read? And he said, no, you shouldn't read any of my books. They're not meant for you, right? Um, the, and I, I don't know if what Nietzsche's saying where he says, 
every profound thinker is more afraid of being understood than misunderstood. Well, I guess you could say every one of what Nietzsche would consider profound thinkers, right? Who had actually penetrated into the depths, who had perceived life for what it really is, and our whole intellectual conceptual world for what it really is, um, would recognize the danger of embarking on that path. And that's why they're more afraid of being understood than misunderstood. Because uh, more than likely, like all the exceptional types that Nietzsche has mentioned, this path will lead to your ruination. And why would you want that? 291, quote, Man, a manifold, mendacious, artificial, and opaque animal, uncanny to the other animals, less because of his strength than because of his cunning and shrewdness, has invented the good conscience to enjoy his soul for once as simple. And the whole of morality is a long, undismayed forgery, which alone makes it at all possible to enjoy the sight of the soul. From this point of view, much more may belong in the concept of art than is generally believed. End quote. Um, so much more may belong in this concept of art than is generally believed. And this is insofar as <laughs> morality itself is this form of art. In many ways, <laughs> Nietzsche's reduced philosophy to art. He's reduced morality to art. He's reduced religion to art. That's so much of what might we say the means that man uses in order to be able to go on living the the recourse he has to illusions is how we might describe art in the most general sense the illusions that we create in order to live and this is why art and life for nietzsche have this link and why science and philosophy the problem of science, the problem of philosophy, the way that they attack illusion is this eternal tension with life, why they always have this unhealthy element to them, this pathological element, the way in which the will to truth when taken to the extreme becomes self-undermining and detrimental, deleterious to life. And so morality is this long forgery which makes it possible to enjoy the sight of the soul. Morality is a forgery because it makes the soul simple. And the way that we that art hides and conceals some things where it brings out some elements, but doesn't want to dig too deeply into other elements. Nietzsche talks about this quite a bit in human all to human in the section on art. And we've talked about this past in past episodes of the podcast of art as a deceptive or art of illusion, right? Or as the, the, the uh, technique of illusion. Um, I don't know if there's a good word for it, the capacity for illusion within the mind and morality is simply one of those that we're actually a manifold, mendacious, and artificial animal. So we have all we don't have this like uh, this simple soul, which is unitary and self identical, but it's manifold. It has all these drives, as we've talked about. When we're mendacious, we're self deceptive, and we're deceptive to others. And artificial, so much of us is uh, ersatz added on, created by society in the project of civilization. And the great art of morality is to take the human soul and make it something we can look at and enjoy the sight of. And I think Nietzsche is being a bit cheeky here, a bit tongue in cheek, but there is something to what he's saying. 292, let's continue. Quote, a philosopher is a human being who constantly experiences, sees, hears, suspects, hopes, and dreams extraordinary things who is struck by his own thoughts as from outside, as from above and below, as by his type of experiences and lightning bolts, who is perhaps himself a storm pregnant with new lightnings, a fatal human being around whom there are constant rumblings and growlings, crevices and uncanny doings. A philosopher, alas, a being that often runs away from itself, often is afraid of itself, but too inquisitive not to come to again, always back to himself. End quote. And I think this is fleshed out and explained by many of the passages we've already looked at of that eternal tension between wandering and always the desire to continue returning to the task of wandering and still yearning for recreation of being a stranger to oneself and yet a seeker after knowledge of being, you know, the, the kind of person who is may, might be frightened by himself and his own thoughts 
his, who experiences his own thoughts as something coming from outside, right? Um, his great insights as something that is almost like an act of genius that just wells up out of him and yet always comes back to examining and studying these thoughts. Very, um, I think, autobiographical again for Nietzsche. 293, quote, A man who says, I like this, I take this for my own and want to protect it and defend it against anybody, a man who is able to manage something, to carry out a resolution, to remain faithful to a thought, to hold a woman, to punish and prostrate one who presume too much, a man who has his wrath and his sword and to whom the weak, the suffering, the hard-pressed, and the animals too like to come, and belong by nature, in short, a man who is by nature a master, when such a man has pity, well, this pity has value. But what good is the pity of those who suffer, or those who worse, preach pity? Almost everywhere in Europe today we find a pathological sensitivity and receptivity to pain, also a repulsive incontinence and lamentation, an increase in tenderness that would use religion and philosophical bric-a-brac to deck itself out as something higher. There is a veritable cult of suffering. The unmanliness of what is baptized as pity in the circles of such enthusiasts is, I should think, what always meets the eye first. This newest kind of bad taste should be exercised vigorously and thoroughly, and I finally wish that one might place around one's heart and neck the good amulet Guy Seber, gay science, to make it plain to the plain. End quote. So, you make it plain to make it straightforward, right? To the plain, to the common people. And the good amulet, gay science. So what is the gay science? Well, it is a, a blending of art and science, in a sense. Of science not as dispassionate, but understood as truth-seeking, which is always passionate and motivated. Understanding ourselves as beings which are not geared to, to seek an objective dispassional truth, but which are geared to, to seek advantage, to win, to expand our power, to um, give rise to something beyond ourselves. All of these things which characterize life, which can broadly be classed under will to power, to understand that as what really drives ourselves and to still pursue the will to truth, uh, but with that knowledge and in this spirit, which is contrary to the spirit of gravity, of heaviness, of being weighed down by the pain of the world. And Nietzsche, again, he continues his critique of pity and says it is a veritable cult of suffering, which again, I think is very informative as to why Nietzsche opposes pity, that it is a means of spreading suffering rather than mitigating it. And yet again, he suggests that there is a form of pity that comes from a noble person, which again, he sort of fetishizes or idealizes here at the end, almost to an uncomfortable degree, but says that pity might be something very different from this type of person, from somebody who is up on a height. But um, it is that common pity, this preaching of pity, this desire to make this feeling of suffering with, of suffering with the suffering, of, of suffering of others, inspiring suffering in you preaching that and making that common and universal. There's something very sick and terrible about that. And Nietzsche's amulet, his cross, if you will, hold up against that vampire of our life energy is the gay science. Immoralist pursuit of truth, right? Rather than the moralist pursuit of truth. Um, his task throughout this entire book, in some sense. To be an artistic Socrates is another way to say it. All right, 294, quote, The Olympian vice, in, in despite of that philosopher who, being a real Englishman, tried to bring laughter into ill repute among all thinking men, laughing is a bad infirmity of human nature, which every thinking mind will strive to overcome, and that's a quote from Hobbes. Nietzsche sa, uh, continues, quote, I should actually risk an order of rank among philosophers depending on the rank of their laughter all the way up to those capable of golden laughter. And supposing that gods too philosophize, which has been suggested to me by many an inference, I should not doubt that they also know how to laugh while in a, a superhuman and new way, and at the expense of all serious things. Gods enjoy mockery, 
seems they cannot suppress laughter even during holy rites. End quote. So we get a sense there in the ways in which, you know, Hobbes, somebody who might have some similarities with Nietzsche, is still very English. And Nietzsche says, you know, uh, <laughs> says that uh, all thinking men will strive to overcome laughter as this infirmity of the mind, to just become these like serious, like uh, drones of knowledge and erudition and good manners and etiquette. And that laughing should be something that we, we strive to overcome. And Nietzsche, on the contrary, says uh, he would risk an order of, of rank among philosophers depending on the rank of their laughter. So the degree to which you can be unburdened by that gravity of pity or the suffering of the world or whatever it is, and take things lightly. To be, I think I've described it this way before, to be serious about taking things lightly. To be exuberant while discussing the gravest topics and to to be able to face the harshest poisons of the soul, the most uh, terrifying truths, without having to have it watered down, muffled, sweetened, falsified. The strength of a soul measured by how much truth it can tolerate and still uh, remain a yes-saying, affirmative, exuberant spirit. And Nietzsche uses the gods, the Greek gods, as his example here, the Olympians. The Olympian vice. What is the Olympian vice? Being able, uh, well, laughter as a vice here, right? And we can see how, even though Hobbes' quote, you might say, is a little ridiculous and, uh, you know, maybe it's like an anomaly, but we can see how going back through all of, um, you know, antiquity da down to the Stoics, uh, and then, of course, the, the Platonists and Socrates, that the indulgence in the passions and the emotions and the affects is seen as a vice. That anything contrary to reason, because, of course, the passions are contrary to reason, and, of course, this is Schopenhauer's attitude as well, that the passions, you know, they have nothing in common except for the fact that they are contrary to reason and the intellect. And this is why laughter is so important to Nietzsche. This... Um, exuberant indulgence in the emotion of joy a joy being a thing that can justify life justify our existence within this world of suffering within this apparently samsaric world and yet every not every but the the titans of philosophy throughout all time are against indulgence and passion against indulgence and laughter or at least they see that as something that is sort of beneath the character of the purely, I mean, if we imagine like the, the pure philosopher king or the pure stoic, right? And this applies also to the ascetics of all religions. The, the greatest, you know, the most committed Buddhist monk, the most sincere Catholic priest, we imagine sort of a stoical expression, a plain-faced expression, someone who is more emotionless. And um, to quote Dr. Cornell West, uh, he says, one of his, uh, one of the greatest riddles of the Western tradition is that Socrates never cries and Jesus never laughs, and we can see why Socrates never cries. You know, he thinks that becoming, uh, you know, morose and depressive can keep you from like being virtuous. And Socrates is concerned with the good life, so of course he can still laugh once in a while. But um, you know, famously in the Republic, he says we should ban dirges and lamentations because these are just going to be hostile to people being able to carry out virtue. It's going to make them lethargic and less productive and so on and so forth. Jesus famously weeps while he's on the cross, but there's no scene of Jesus laughing. Jesus doesn't love life, right? He's not of this world. He is promising the kingdom of heaven, which is the rapture from this world, the escape from this world. So he does not take joy in this world. Um, and Meanwhile, the Greek gods, in contrast, this image of the divine from this, Nietzsche wants to, to look back to this past perspective on the divine. And we there's even a, another layered meaning here if we take the gods to be in the sense that Ares could be seen as sort of like your drive or your impulse to rage, or Eros is your sexual impulse. You know, you could see the gods as analogous to sort of like the drives and the way that 
Nietzsche was talking about in the previous passage, the thought seizes the philosopher seemingly from outside. The Greeks perceived their emotional states as being seized or possessed by a god or a muse from outside. That the passions themselves were divine in the Greek religion prior to the arrival of the Socratic school, the Platonist school. And so the image of the gods then is a passionate image in ancient Greece. And um, they cannot suppress their laughter even during holy rites, that the sacred and the profane are unified in some sense. The next aphorism is 295, The Genius of the Heart. And this is a beautiful passage, an amazing passage. And it's a passage I'm not going to exegesize at all, uh, because we did a whole episode on it called The Genius of the Heart. That being said, I am going to read it because we're at the end of the book and um, it's worth reading it again because it is the greatest prose poem of all of Nietzsche's work and it is the perfect capstone to the uh, end of this book, the structure of this book, the house, the temple that Nietzsche has constructed here. So without further ado, we'll read The Genius of the Heart. And if you want more elaboration on it, you can look to that other episode to um, find you know that elaboration. Or you can just, I think if you've listened to this entire read-through up until now, uh, and you haven't heard that episode, I think you'll still understand this poem and understand, uh, at least on a experiential level, emotional level, on an instinctive level, maybe what Nietzsche is trying to get across, even if we don't have to spoil all of his wonderful words by uh, exegesizing about it. So uh, without further ado, the genius of the heart, aphorism 295, quote, the genius of the heart, as that great concealed one possesses it, the tempter God and born pied piper of consciences, whose voice knows how to descend into the netherworld of every soul who does not say a word or cast a glance in which there is no consideration and ulterior enticement, whose mastery includes the knowledge of how to seem, not what he is, but what is to those who follow him one more constraint to press ever closer to him in order to follow him ever more inwardly and thoroughly. The genius of the heart who silences all that is loud and self-satisfied, teaching it to listen, who smooths rough souls and lets them taste a new desire, to lie still as a mirror, that the deep sky may mirror itself in them. The genius of the heart, who teaches the doltish and rash hand to hesitate and reach out more delicately, who guesses the concealed and forgotten treasure, the drop of graciousness and sweet spirituality under dim and thick ice, and is a divining rod for every grain of gold that has long lain buried in the dungeon of much mud and sand. The genius of the heart, from whose touch everyone walks away richer, and having received grace and surprised, not as blessed and oppressed by alien gods, but richer in himself, newer to himself than before, broken open, blown at, and sounded out by a thawing wind, perhaps more unsure, tenderer, more fragile, more broken, but full of hopes that as yet have no name, full of new will and currents, full of new dissatisfaction and undertoes, but what am I doing, my friends? Of who am I speaking to you? Have I forgotten myself so far that I have not even told you his name? Unless you have guessed by yourselves who this questionable spirit and God is, who wants to be praised in such fashion. For just as happens to everyone who from childhood has always been on his way and in foreign parts, many strange and not undangerous spirits have crossed my path too. But above all, he of whom I was speaking just now, and he again and again, namely no less a one than the god Dionysus, that great ambiguous one and tempter god to whom I once offered, as you know, in all secrecy and reverence, my firstborn, as the last, it seems to me, who offered him a sacrifice, for I have found no one who understood what I was doing then. Meanwhile, I have learned much, all too much, more about the philosophy of this god, and as I said, from mouth to mouth, I, the last disciple and initiate of the god Dionysus, and I suppose I might begin at long last to offer you, my friends, a few tastes of this philosophy, insofar as this is permitted to me, in an undertone as is fair, for it concerns much that is secret, new, strange, odd, 
uncanny. Even that Dionysus is a philosopher, and that gods too thus do philosophy, seems to me to be a novelty that is far from innocuous, and might arouse suspicion precisely among philosophers. Among you, my friends, it will not seem so offensive, unless it comes too late and not at the right moment. For today, as I have been told, you no longer like to believe in God and gods. Perhaps I shall also have to carry frankness further in my tale than will always be pleasing to the strict habits of your ear. Certainly the god in question went further, much further, in the dialogues of this sort, and was always many steps ahead of me. Indeed, if it were permitted to follow human custom, and according to him many solemn pomp and virtue names, I should have to give abundant praise to his explorer and discoverer courage, his daring honesty, truthfulness, and love of wisdom. But such a god has no use whatever for all such venerable junk and pomp. Keep that, he would say, for yourself and your likes and whoever else has need of it. I have no reason for covering my nakedness. One guesses, this type of deity and philosopher is perhaps lacking in shame. Thus he once said, under certain circumstances, I love what is human. And with this he alluded to Ariadne, who was present. Man is, to my mind, an agreeable, courageous, inventive animal that has no equal on earth. It finds its way in any labyrinth. I am well disposed towards him. I often reflect how I might yet advance him and make him stronger, more evil, and more profound than he is. Stronger, more evil, and more profound? I asked, startled. Yes, he said once more. Stronger, more evil, and more profound and also more beautiful. And at that the tempter god smiled with his halcyon smile, as though he had just paid an enchanting compliment. Here we also see, what this divinity lacks is not only a sense of shame, and there are also other good reasons for conjecturing that in several respects all of the gods could learn from us humans. We humans are more humane. End quote. And I said I wasn't going to say anything about this passage, but it's a reiteration or a rephrasing of the very statement of Zarathustra at the beginning of the work, that he loves man because he's a bridge and not a goal. Um, there's this deep abiding love for mankind in Nietzsche, but a reimagining of what love means that is not Christian love, that's not just pity for man's suffering but a belief that all of this suffering, all of the, uh, what would we say, the failed experiments and <laughs> botched great men and exceptions that didn't turn out well and all of the um, oppression and violence and the exploitation that is a necessary part of life and all of the abattoir of nature and the millions of failed organisms that are needed to bring forth a species, that all of this had a meaning in some sense, not a meaning as handed down from the divine, but one that we can create insofar as if we use all of this to transform into something greater, to continue the project of life, of always proceeding into the future with an eye for how to elevate ourselves, elevate mankind. Um, all of that will have been for a purpose. And furthermore, the other main element of this passage is Nietzsche describing the role that he's playing here as a teacher. And that the main aspect of this passage could be generosity, wanting everyone to come away richer, to smooth out rough souls, to give us um, lead us through labyrinths and offer us insights that, um, or offer us to help us along the way in finding our own insights that we may never have found. And so with this, I'm going to read the final passage of Beyond Good and Evil, uh, which is 296, in which uh, Nietzsche reflects on this entire project and this entire book, this entire journey that we've all come on together. And this idea of uh, stating a case for the exception in the language of the rule, which, of course, language itself is always the language of the rule, as we've discussed, because what in the end is common 
all cognition is common. And this is, again, this great tension in Nietzsche's work. And has he succeeded? Um, and what, what, does, what does succeeding even mean to a fatalist, right? Um, who would think that uh, the intermediary aspect of the intellect does not actually interrupt cause and effect, does not actually separate doer and the deed, that this is a form of superstition or illusion, and that every quanta of power will continue to draw its final consequence at every moment. And so there's nothing for you to change. And in some sense, whether you preach this doctrine of the exception or not doesn't really matter, right? But I think <laughs> we could say that the type of person Nietzsche is right? Uh, it's not his choice either, whether he preaches this doctrine of the exception or not. And that this entire book is his involuntary and unconscious autobiography, as we've said before. And this entire book is a mask, which conceals something but betrays even more. And that there was something that Nietzsche needed, that something he found necessary in writing this book that I think might have to do, as I said before, with especially considering a lot of these last aphorisms and pity and his opposition to pity, that it isn't just that intellectually he believes, well, well, let's look at what life is and what actually advances and furthers life. It's not pity. From that perspective of life, pity is actually something that could be rather pathological if universalized and could become a condemnation on life, which is what religions like Christianity have done. That's his great opposition to them. But that there might be something even more... Uh, fundamental and actually quite simple about Nietzsche's opposition to pity that he was the kind of man who didn't want to be pitied and uh, there are many other interpretations of what the meaning of this book is and trying to psychologize Nietzsche and why he writes it but um, we're going to leave all of those aside and I'm not going to give any more commentary I'm just going to read this last aphorism 296 and with that we will end the episode Quote, Alas, what are you, after all, my written and painted thoughts? It was not long ago that you were still so colorful, young and malicious, full of thorns and secret spices. You made me sneeze and laugh, and now? You have already taken off your novelty, and some of you are ready, I fear, to become truths. They already look so immortal, so pathetically decent, so dull, and has it ever been different? What things do we copy, writing and painting, we mandarins with Chinese brushes, we immortalizers of things that can be written? What are the only things we are able to paint? Alas, always only what is on the verge of withering and losing its fragrance. Alas, always only storms that are passing, exhausted, and feelings that are autumnal and yellow. Alas, always only birds that grew weary of flying and flew astray, and now can be caught by hand, by our hand. We immortalize what cannot live and fly much longer, only weary and mellow things. And it is only your afternoon, you, my written and painted thoughts, for which alone I have colors, many colors perhaps, many motley caresses and fifty yellows and browns and greens and reds. But nobody will guess from that how you looked in your morning, you sudden sparks, and wonders of my solitude, you, my old, beloved, wicked thoughts. End quote. Now, there is a poem at the end called uh, From High Mountains. It's the after song. Uh, we read that at the end of season two, uh, and I, I'm not going to read it again here because I think the passages at the end of the actual aphorisms, the main text, are a much stronger ending. Even though I do, I do quite love that poem uh, from High Mountains, but it's a more profound ending to end here. Um, and I said I wasn't going to elaborate any further, so all I will say at this point is thank you for joining me. And I hope, at least for some of you, I have been a guide to the perplexed for some of the aphorisms here, and at the very least... Um, been a companion for you while you have read along with this book and hopefully when you now if you've only read the book once or twice or even three times when you read the book again as is required for understanding it uh, with my 
humble guidance, maybe you will come to even more insights and hopefully even some things that I haven't said or pointed out that uh, you can find because it is a treasure trove. And as I've said, one of my favorite books, if not my absolute favorite book. All right. Thank you, everybody. It's been a long time coming, but we finally reached the end. Um, this is Keegan from the Nietzsche podcast signing off until next season, which is coming in a couple weeks. All right. Bye. If you enjoyed the Nietzsche podcast or found it helpful, you can visit us and support the show at patreon.com slash untimely reflections. The link is in the description or just share the show with any of your friends that you think might enjoy it or on social media. Thank you for your support.